Welcome back to the show. I am blown away by the initial positive response that these video casts are getting. And I want to encourage you to use this information freely. It is my hope that you will share this with people that you care about, with organizations that mean a lot to you that are struggling with some of the concepts that we all find difficult. You know, it is it is really hard to give feedback. And I've found that most organizations really lack the ability or the tools or even the understanding to give proper feedback. So what I've done today is I've given you a peek into what I call effective feedback. And before we get into that, I wanted to share with you just a little bit about what it takes to communicate effectively, kind of as a setting the stage for the feedback piece. So if you think about what it takes to be an effective communicator, there are three things that make us effective. And if you think about them in the context of a principle, they sound something like this. Effective communication is an ongoing process that facilitates the exchange of information in order to compel correct action. Now let me read that again. Effective communication is an ongoing process that facilitates an exchange of information in order to compel correct or even desired action. In other words, if we're going to communicate effectively, it has to be ongoing. You have to keep going over and over and over. People have different absorption methods. Not everybody absorbs information the same way. Think of it like this. If you are wanting to get a message across, that message has to have a certain amount of repetition that helps us just understand what you're trying to tell us. In other words, Think of it like coaching. How many times do we say the same things over and over again so that a player will actually understand exactly what we mean and hopefully start to apply it in their own lives? The second part of what makes communication effective is it has to be an exchange of information. One-way communication is communication, but it's not effective. In order for communication to become effective, it has to have a sender and a receiver. We both have an opportunity to make that communication effective because it lets us know how the receiver is actually getting the information or processing the information. And then the third part that makes communication effective is it has to derive some sort of action, some sort of response to the communication that affirms that they got it and not only got it but they got it in a way that makes you understand that the receiver got your message. So let me repeat those again. Effective communication is an ongoing process. Think of it like having t-shirts made for your department or your organization. What would be the message that you wanted on the back of the t-shirt so that everybody knew this is what you stood for? I love Brene's new book, Dare to Lead. She talks about how we have to boil our values down to two values because when they are when they're conceptualized in a manner that have more than two values, they become, well, they lack focus. They, they're not able for us to, to really genuinely adopt as our own. So in communication, I want you to think about this idea that we have to be able to create a message that people can resonate with, that they hear us say over and over. I, I didn't realize that the t-shirt thing was funny until just a few years ago I was coaching baseball and I'd had the team for a while and, and the mom started wanting to make practice shirts. And one of the things that I said over and over and over was this go to work when we got someone on base. I said, let's go to work. Let's move a runner. If we got a runner in third base in scoring position, I'd say, hey, let's go to work. Let's get this run in. So the moms had t-shirts made that said go to work on the back. And then with the boys, I would always tell them, because we were playing tournament baseball, I said, how do we play the game? And they would go one pitch, one inning one game at a time. Win this pitch, win this game, win this inning. If you do that, then your chances of staying competitive remains high. So what would go on the back of your t-shirt? What would be the ongoing message that you want people to have for you? Part two is the exchange of information. If someone is not receiving the communication and receiving it in a way that they can apply it, then it's probably not effective. And then probably the most neglected form of communication is the call to action. What do you want me to do with this information that you're delivering to me? Have you ever left a meeting and looked at your coworker or thought to yourself, why was I invited to that meeting? What did it have to do with me? If that 
was what you thought, then the deliverer of the message did not give you a clear call to action. Sometimes the clear call to action might be just, hey, I want you to be aware of this. If you're aware of this, then we know what to do with the information. We'll file it in our be aware category. But when we don't know what to do with information, it typically ends up in file 13. So how do you know you've effectively communicated? There's two ways. Your audience begins to speak your message. In other words, they start to say the things that you say over and over and over. Just like with the kids, when I would say, how do we play the game? They could finish the mantra. One pitch, one inning, one game at a time. And secondly, they begin to behave in a way that you intended. In other words, they begin to behave in a way that supports the message. So you keep communicating until those two things happen. Now, it's funny how you deliver a message can also be extremely important for communication to be effective. I was blown away by this little activity I'm going to introduce to you, but I'm going to read a seven-word sentence seven different ways. And I want you to notice how the meaning of the sentence changes based on what word I emphasize. So here's number one. I never said she didn't like you. When I ask audiences what that means, they, they automatically get it, that, that someone else said it, but it wasn't you. And then number two, I never said she didn't like you. And I ask the audience, what does that mean? They say, well, you're adamant. You never said it. And then number three, I never said she didn't like you. Well, of course, they say, well, you, someone implied it, someone thought it, someone wrote it down, someone put it in an email, someone sent a text, but you just never said it. And think about number four, I never said she didn't like you. Of course, that means someone else doesn't like you. And then number five, I never said she didn't like you. And of course, that means that maybe she does. Maybe there's a question around the word didn't. We're not sure. And then number seven says, I never said she didn't like you. Well, of course, the audience tells me, well, that means they didn't like someone else. So before this activity, I never conceptually understood how a seven-word sentence could have seven totally distinctive meanings just based on which word is emphasized. But it makes so much sense. Now you can understand how people can have a quick conversation in the hallway and one person leave thinking everything's okay and the other person leaves going, I can't believe she said that. And they're angry over what you said. And then later on when you come back in contact with that individual and they're giving you a little bit of attitude and you ask them, what's wrong with you? And they say, well, you said this. And you look at them and said, no, I never said that. And they go, you stood right here and said it to my face. Remember, they're remembering what they heard. You're remembering what you thought you said. So when it comes to delivering feedback, we have to understand that the word we emphasize is powerful and that our message can be misinterpreted deliberately and literally using the same language that we intended to mean something different. Think about this. If we put that seven-word sentence, I never said she didn't like you, in an email, which one of the seven ways is the receiver going to get that message? Or if we send it in a text, how are they going to receive the message? There's no way to know. You know, we've created a whole sub-language in order to help understand texting because of this very issue, because of this very idea. In 2019, what language aid have we created that will allow someone to understand the intention of your text? Some people call them emojis, some people call them emoticons, but yes, th those are so that we can understand the feeling behind your text, which I think is very interesting. You know, how is language going to keep evolving through the medium of texting and, and emailing, which is predominant for most people? So before you're going to give someone feedback, you have to make sure that people see you as approachable. And when I ask a group, I said, what are some things we can do to show people that, hey, you can approach me, that you can come to me, especially if I'm in a position of power, if I'm the boss, if I'm the supervisor, if I'm the CEO. People may not feel comfortable coming to me unless I demonstrate approachability. So here are some things that you can do to be more approachable with people that you work with, especially if you're in a position of power. The first thing is to smile. 
you know, I was working with a, a superintendent who also supervised one of the supervisors that, that were on his team. And it just so happened that the supervisor and the superintendent's wives were nurses at the same hospital. And the supervisor's wife told the superintendent's wife that your husband walks around with a frown on his face at work all the time. So, of course, if a wife hears that, she's going to share that with her husband. So she went to the superintendent, the wife did, and said, hey, what's this I hear about you walking around with a frown on your face all the time? And he looked at her funny and he goes, I'm not frowning, I'm thinking. And she told him, she said, well, you better walk around with a different look on your face because everybody thinks you're angry or upset all the time. So people draw inferences into our lack of smiling or our lack of facial expressions when people come in contact with us, even in a general sense while we're at work. So what else can we do to show approachability? We can make eye contact with people. We can be the one that initiates that connection with someone that we work with. We can say hello. We can make sure that our facial expressions are friendly, that someone can feel comfortable connecting with us. And in order to be approachable, don't be in a rush all the time. Because if you look busy, then people are going to assume that you're busy. You know, when I was in the Army many years ago, especially as a private, we were told, if you don't want to get put on a detail, if you want to be left alone, always carry paper in your hand and walk really fast. And everybody thinks, man, that soldier's on a mission. He's busy. So it was a perception of being busy that kept us from being approachable, even by the people that were up the chain of command. So once you become approachable, how do you show genuine interest in others? How do you make people think that you're really interested in what they have to say? The first way to do that is to ask questions when they're engaging you. And my favorite questions are how and what questions. I call those calibrated questions. How do you think that turned out the way it did? You know, what do you think is the reason that happened? Those are powerful questions that get more insight, but it also shows that you're genuinely interested in what people have to say. You can also show genuine interest by stop doing what you're doing. You know, there is this terrible habit that some people have of calling, calling it multitasking, calling what they do as okay because they're busy. So think of it like this. If a subordinate comes up to you and you're on your computer typing an email and you're wanting them to share information with you, how genuinely interested do they think you're, you are in that moment? How interested do they think you are in what they have to say? So stop doing what you're doing. There's no such thing as effective multitasking anyway. Our brain gets diluted and it's just well, I think it's just plain rude. Don't answer your phone. Don't look at your email. The only way that it's okay to answer your phone is if you pre-script that behavior with them. In other words, if you come to my desk and you want to tell me something and I say, hey, Larry, you have my undivided attention, but I'm waiting on a phone call. If it comes in, I really need to take it. So you're giving someone a little bit of an insight that, hey, if this comes in, I have to bail. I have to take the call because I've been waiting on it. You can also show genuine interest by nodding or affirming. Lean towards them. And the biggest thing is wait until they finish to speak. You know, there's, a, there's an idea that we call let the silence do the heavy lifting. And silence and an affirming nod is a great way for you to show someone that, yeah, I get it. I, I hear what you're saying, and it's, it's important. It's a big deal. So how do you know if other people can consider you to be approachable or genuinely interested? Well, it's real simple. There's two ways. People approach you, and people come to you and ask for input. If people aren't coming to you on a regular basis, if they're not asking you for your input, then you may have approachability issues, and you may have genuine interest issues. So do you know that the number one issue in most companies, when I asked them when we first engaged, I said, what, what are you struggling with? What's... What's something that really needs to improve in your organization? And the first thing I get is communication. We don't communicate effectively. We need to get better at communication. It's something we all struggle with from time to time. And you know what the number one reason is that we don't communicate effectively? It's because we're lazy. It takes work from becoming or from going 
from being a communicator to an effective communicator. It takes effort. It takes deliberate work. The people that we label as effective communicators work hard at it. And it's something that they have practiced, they've formed habits around, they've made it important in their lives. Most successful outcomes are based on effective communication. If you think about any recent struggle that you've had as a business, as an organization, and you really dissect it and do an autopsy on what happened, in the Army we call them after action reviews, AARs. When you look at some occurrence through that lens, you can almost always pick out opportunities for better communication. We should have planned the mission a little bit better. We should have you know, looked at these potential problems earlier. I should have given clearer expectations of what success lo looks like. You know, what's the definition of done? You know, how often have you asked somebody for something and they delivered it to you and you looked at it and go, this is not what I wanted at all. I wanted something completely different. Is it their fault? Or was it your fault for not describing what done looks like? Brene Brown says, how do we paint done? In other words, how do we paint a picture of what done looks like together so that we're on the same page? And that takes work. That takes time. And we don't often want to deliver the amount of time it takes to be an effective communicator. But then we often don't get what we wanted in the first place anyway. So all of these descriptions about what it takes to be an effective communicator are what I call the foundation for giving really good feedback to people. So this show is about how do I deliver effective feedback to people so that they know where they stand with me, so that they understand that I'm not happy with something or that I want something different, especially as their supervisor. So the first thing is when you're gonna give feedback to someone, it has to meet certain criteria. And the first criteria is be descriptive with your feedback. Describe observable behavior. What did or does the person actually say or do? Don't make judgments. Be specific. Don't say you never come to work on time. Say, hey, you were late on this day, this day, and this day. You know, describe the behavior in the context of the actual situation. What was a specific incident or situation in which the behavior occurred? You know, when we make judgments or when we lack specificity, people are confused about what to do. So instead of saying, hey, you're being careless, say, hey, three jars were broken in the last hour. What's going on? Instead of saying, you're being lazy, say, hey, production is down 10% today compared to yesterday. Behind judgments, there are always observable, observable facts that we have to fish out in order to let them know exactly what we were doing. But judgment and lack of specificity always inflames the feedback. But people have a hard time arguing with facts. Make sure that your feedback is given as soon after the behavior as possible. And what I tell people is if, if there is an emotional response that you have to someone's activity or someone's results, get over that activity, but then give feedback as soon as you possibly can once you've gotten through the emotional response. You know, I was 24 years old the first time I got to be a supervisor, and I broke all the rules. I didn't, I didn't know any of this. This was, this was information that I needed, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was the guy, the pleaser, the person that wanted people to like me. And I really honestly thought at 24 that if people liked me, they'd do what I said. I didn't understand that giving feedback was necessary to be respected as a boss. And I would put it off and put it off and put it off until the kettle and the pressure vessel just blew up. And then I would deliver it in a way that was probably not very effective, especially if I was angry. Make sure if you're giving feedback that the receiver can control what you're giving them feedback on and, and that they have a way of doing something about it. The worst thing you can do is beat someone up over, over feedback that they have no control over. And then the last criteria that makes feedback effective is make sure that it's communicated clearly. In other words, ask the question, you know, what, what is your understanding of what we've just talked about? Or how can we make sure that we're on the same message? I call that checking the pulse. So if you take the feedback criteria and you put it into a methodology, this is the nugget from today's show. 
The first thing you want to do is, is understand that there are five steps that makes feedback successful. And the first step is determining the intention. And I, I'm going to give you an example of this in a moment, so stay with me. What's the intention of the feedback? Do you remember when you were little, if you were summoned to the principal's office, it wasn't the fact that you were going to the principal's office that really concerned you. It was you were thinking, you know, what did I do? What am I in trouble for? You know, so people want to understand what is the intention that you want to talk to me about? What is the major outcome or end result you desire from the communication? And then the second is, what are the reasons that this, communi that this communication is taking place? You know, how is this outcome or result beneficial to me, my area, or the organization? In training circles, we call it WIFM and WIFO, W-I-F-M and W-I-F-O. What's in it for me? What's in it for the organization? And I'll show you how that works in a moment when we talk about absenteeism. And then the next step in the feedback process is define your expectations. What needs to happen in order to achieve the outcome or result? In other words, what do you want me to do? And then you get your call to action. That's how am I supposed to process this information into real world verb oriented action statements. In other words, my call to action is this. My call to action is go and pick up that order and bring it back to my office by 3 p.m. And then the last step is check the pulse. How well did the listener receive the information being communicated? And that's usually done by a what or how question, a calibrated question. So let me go back through the five steps again. First one is determine the intention describe the reasons, define your expectations, give a clear call to action, and check the pulse. So let me show you how these work in a real world context. So let's say I'm talking to Joe about absenteeism. And I'm going to give him feedback in a way that meets all of the criteria that we just talked about. So here's how it would sound in a real life setting if I'm talking to Joe about absenteeism. I would say, Joe, I understand that we've got a lot going on, and, and, and sometimes there are things away from work that cause us to need to miss work. Children, I get it. You know, I'm a dad. I understand. But absenteeism and the resulting turnover costs our organization at least $200,000 a year. And as a result, we're unable to make organizational improvements. Our cost to make our products is higher. Our ability to even give you a raise is decreased or limited. If we improve our attendance as an organization, as a company, we all benefit and life is better for everyone. I need you to be here when we schedule you so that we eliminate the ripple effect of moving people or paying overtime to cover your job. What can we do to improve your attendance over the next 30 days? And then you just shut up and let him answer the question. So let me go through that again. This is Joe who's got an attendance problem. And I call him into my office and I'm going to give him feedback because of absenteeism. And I'm going to first start by building a little rapport with him. I'm going to say, hey, Joe, hey, I understand that we've got a lot going on away from work. Kids, parents, I, I get it. I, I totally understand it. But absenteeism and the resulting overtime is costing our organization over $200,000 each year. As a result, we're unable to make organizational improvements. Our cost to make our products is higher. Our ability to increase even your own wages is limited. If we all improve our attendance as a company, everyone benefits and life is better for everyone. I need you to be here when we schedule you so that we eliminate the ripple effect of moving people around and are paying overtime to cover your job. What can we do in the next 30 days, in the next 60 days, in the next 90 days to improve your attendance? And by the way, it's always important to say we there because there may be things that we can do that I can do as the supervisor to help Joe's attendance. For example, let's say Joe's a single dad and he tells me, he says, John, I, I really want to be here and I'm, I'm not missing work on purpose, but you know, there are times when I have to be at the doctor with my daughter and I don't have anyone that can help me 
do that, and it's it just falls on me. You know, she's she's going through ear infection after ear infection after ear infection, and I don't have any other way other than dealing with it myself. I've got another child. I I don't have anybody else. So that might mean for me as a supervisor is, hey, what can I do to help? Maybe I can work work by putting them on another shift, but maybe there's something I can do. Here's another example. Let's say that it's showing up late. And if we just put the burden back on him and allow him to solve the problem by himself, then we don't have the ability to help him through this situation, especially if he's a good worker. But let's say we're talking about coming to work on time. And when I say, what can we do to get you to come to work better or more often and be here when we need you? And he says, look, here, here's my problem. He goes, I drop my daughter off at school every morning, and I cannot drop her off before 730. There's no one there to supervise, and we're in trouble if we do that. And the way traffic works between her school, which is the closest school to where I work, is that if I am two or three minutes either way, traffic causes me to be a few minutes late. And there are some days I can drop her off right at 7.30 and there's a teacher there to receive her and I can get on the road and traffic will allow me to be at work on time. There are other days when I can drop her off at 7.30 sharp and traffic will not allow me to be here. So maybe as a supervisor I can say, well, why don't we start your day at 8.30 and go to 5.30 instead of 8 to 5. And I'm just making something up. I'm just showing you that we are culpable as the leader and also helping them solve the problem especially if we have the power to do that. So I hope you've realized that effective communication is like a foundation. And then feedback is one skill that we build on top of effective communication. And I'll tell you this, if you can use this five-step method for giving feedback, you are probably in the highest percent percentile of leaders. Because I work with leaders at all levels that do not know that there is a tool to give feedback. Now, if you've liked this video today, if you found value in this, make sure that you click like below, subscribe to this channel if this was valuable for you, and even share this with other people. My whole purpose of this is to give free information to people so that they can benefit from being better at this thing we call leadership. And I always try to give something away in every video, but if you will go to www.john grubs g-r-u-b-b-s dot com at the top of my home page I'm giving away a copy of my first leadership book titled leadership among idiots and it is a humorous look at servant leadership it is a book about the idea that when we say yes to a supervisory position that we're in a position of service to those people that we lead and all you have to do is click on that. You can download it as a Mobi file. You can download it as a PDF file. But I want to give something away every time I speak. Share the love. And I'll always end each video by reminding you that this quest for perfection in life, this idea that we have to be perfect in order to be successful is a myth. Perfection is something that will probably not ever be attained. And these videos, you know, I promise, these videos are one take videos. I do these to show you, to model for you that I'm imperfect. But I hope you can see that there's still value in the content and in the delivery, even though it's not a perfect video. So remember this as I sign off share this information with people, spread the love, always default to kindness. Always understand that leadership is about service and being a servant. And remember that done is better than perfect. Thank you.